Hello, I'm Martha Eddy, and I am just so pleased to be here as part of the Somatic Movement Summit in 2023. And today my guest is going to be Simon Borg Olivier, and uh, I am so pleased to meet with you. Welcome. It's my honor and my privilege to be here with you. Thank you very much for having me. You're so welcome. I want to share with everybody a little about you, your uh bio in very short, because it's much longer than this, is that Simon Borg Olivier has been practicing yoga for 50 years and teaching for 35. He's also been a registered physiotherapist for 20 years. Simon's co-director of Yoga Synergy, one of Australia's oldest and most respected schools. He's a research scientist and a university lecturer. So again, welcome, Simon. I look forward to this conversation. And I want to dive right in and hear more about your bio, and in particular, um, the physiology of the body, how you got to be interested in the depth of that science and become a research scientist. Well, okay. You know, my, um, my first introduction to the world of what we could call loosely yoga was my mum. My mum taught me about connection. And uh, one of my teachers was actually mentioned that to me recently, uh, Sundanat, who's, who's also going to be on this um, on this summit. He actually reminded me that this is what in India everyone says that your first teacher is your mother, and then your next teacher is your father. And this is how it was for me. My mother taught me about love, and to me, if we use the word yoga which to me could also be many other words in other different cultures and languages, because every traditional culture has their yoga. You know, loosely Qigong in China is the same principle in a way. And, you know, Native Americans, Indigenous Australians all have their yoga. It's the recognition that we're all connected as one. It's the recognition that modern physicists have, where they say everything is connected and the ultimate connecting uniting force is consciousness. And so that recognition for me came first with my mother, because she is the epitome of love to me. And really, if you're trying to connect with anything, any other person, for example, the way you do it is the way a mother connects with her child, the child who was actually inside her growing as part of her. She knows she's connected to the child. So what she does is she shares her good energy and loving information with that child. It's the only way to acknowledge connection. It's about love. So my mum, bless her, she passed away a couple of years ago, is the ultimate in my teaching uh, gurus, you know, so she was my, my number one. My father, taught me so many wonderful principles in life. You know, he was an army captain and he taught me so much about how to be in life. And what he actually taught me practically at six years old was I found that I went to my first swimming uh, tests, you know, like you had to pass the 50 meter swimming certificate before you're allowed to go to certain school excursions. And I could not swim, I kept sinking. So my father was, not only in the army, but he was an expert free diver. And so he could swim so far underwater. And so he taught me, he said, okay, son, son, if you can't swim on top of the water, I'll teach you how to swim underneath. And so I actually got my six-year-old underwater, my six-year-old 50 meter certificate for swimming underwater. And no one complained. I got there, I didn't die. And so it became the mainstay of my practice. And it wasn't until... I was in my late teens that I actually realized it was yoga of sorts. And one of the ways I realized, and this is the connection with the, the science that I got, was in high school science, they were talking about the nervous system. And they said there are two parts to the nervous system. There's the conscious nervous system called the somatic nervous system, which you can control with your conscious mind. And then there's the autonomic or automatic nervous system, which cannot be controlled by the conscious mind. And then in brackets in this textbook, it said, except by some Indian yogis. And I went, ah, who are these strange people who can control their unconscious? Then sometime after that, I saw a picture of this pretty much naked, holy person sitting in what looked like Mount Everest behind them, you know, snow all around them. And my teacher showed me the picture and said, this person is meditating. This person is doing yoga. 
and the words meditation and yoga became synonymous, which is funny because in the modern world today, yoga is very misunderstood. Yoga is, is thought to be, if you look on Instagram, it's about stretching to do the splits or balancing in a handstand or all the things that people can't do and are often put off by. It's often really missing the point of yoga. And meditation is something like sitting in a cold room, getting cold and bored and putting blankets over yourself. But come the 1980s, because I, you know, I was growing up in the 60s and 70s, come the 1980s, I noticed that everyone was meditating. And I said, but meditation, that's so hard. You have to sit naked in the snow. And so I realized then that they're not really meditating. They're, they're concentrating. They might be doing something which might be relaxing. But I realized that the most important aspect of meditation and true yoga, which really are the same word, is you need to be doing something which is sustainable, engaging, calming, effortless, but it must be invigorating. And invigorating basically means on a physiological level, to be invigorating and calm at the same time, you have to learn how to move blood very effectively through your body without making the heart race. So you have to be totally relaxed, yet have excellent circulation. And I realized around probably 10 or 15 years into my adult practices that I wasn't really doing yoga. I was doing a combination of exercise and relaxation. You know, I got some really good teachings in my late teens by a Tibetan Lama, who I really resonated with. And he taught me some magical things. Just I was 17 and I spent a year with him visiting him every week. And then in my early 20s, I did a lot of aerobics and a lot of, you know, fitness training. And I ended up injuring so many joints. You know, I, I, I ended up breaking my neck doing gymnastics. I, I got stabbed in my first sword fighting lesson, not badly, just enough to pierce the skin and put me off. I dislocated the buttocks. Is that possible in my first Taekwondo class? You know, basically I'm, and I, I damaged my knee. I dislocated my knee and, and tore the ACL. So my teacher said, you know, my aerobics teacher said, you can't run anymore. You have to just stand in the corner and do this. And it was so dull and so boring. So they invited me to a yoga class, a stretch class. And up until that point, the only yoga I knew was the word yoga of the Tibetan Lama and in Naked in the Snow. And also my Tibetan Lama who taught me these esoteric philosophies and some strange breathing exercises. But the yoga that I went to on the first class when I was in my early 20s, it was Nothing. They were just sitting in a funny position, twisting, and I'm going, what's the point of this? This doesn't make any sense at all. So I was put off the physical modern practice of yoga at first. So I went to aerobics and gymnastics and things like this. Then when I injured myself so badly from this modern exercise routine, I got led back into a stretch class, which I didn't know was also a yoga class. And the stretching was a bit helpful. And then one day, the stretch teacher was absent. So they invited an Iyenga yoga teacher to come and take the place of the stretch teacher. And suddenly I found myself in the same position I'd been in a few years before in the one yoga class I'd gone to and went, I don't like this. And suddenly she said things like, push down here with your foot, tighten this muscle, press this muscle. And suddenly it came alive. Then I realized she'd learned off this man, BKS Iyengar. And so pretty soon after that, I went to see Mr. Iyengar and I studied with him over a period of about 10, 15 years almost, going maybe seven or eight times to study with him for a month at, at a time. Around the same time, I studied with Kepatabi Joyce and Sri Desika Cha, who were the, probably the three main known teachers of um, Krishnamacharya. And that was wonderful. But then around 10 years into my teaching time, incidentally, my beginning of my teaching time was with Japanese teachers. They were the ones who gave me my first teacher training certificate. And so I learned Japanese yoga, Tibetan yoga, then Indian yoga. Then in my late teens, I was working with the indigenous cultures of uh, Australia. And I lived in an Aboriginal housing estate and I had some really wonderful, precious interactions, which led me to some understandings that it took me a while to understand, but it became incorporated into my practice. And around uh, toward the end of my 20s, I realized I didn't really understand 
what yoga was teaching. So I went back to university. I was a molecular biologist in the beginning and uh, I studied physiotherapy and I tried to incorporate physiotherapy into my understanding of yoga. It was good and I learned a lot, but it was a very reductionist approach. And after a while I realized that you can't approach a holistic system like yoga with a reductionist mentality of the Western mind. So I kept searching, I kept looking, and you know, gradually I've been piecing things together. But a good revelation came to me when I started working with a couple of Chinese teachers, one of whom was the senior student when Bruce Lee was the junior student of the teacher Yip Man. And I was with him for a couple of years, Grandmaster William Chung, and he taught me a lot. And that was about 30 years ago. And then after that, about 15, 20 years ago, I met Master Zhen Hua Yang, who I would love to introduce this him to this summit, but he his English is not really ideal to, to come on a summit like this. But he has taught me amazing things. And what I really like about him is that he speaks from personal experience. He's about the same age as me, it is much more powerful, much more capable. But his grandfather is still alive and he's 120 this year and can still do incredible things. So when Master Yang says to me, my grandfather says this, I go, mm, OK, because, you know, in the modern world, the people who are most popular in the world of yoga and fitness are on Instagram. And they'll do amazing things. And, you know, now I'm 63 this year. I'm in my seventh decade and I can do a few fancy tricks. But, you know, I mean, basically at 63, most people are lucky enough if they've if they can walk, I reckon, you know. So when I was in my 20s, I could do a lot more. And I was very cocky in my 20s. I think I was very, you know, full of I know everything. And you see these people on the Internet and they're capable. They're good. They're, they're wonderful people. But really, if you had to trust someone who's going to teach about longevity and how to live a long, fruitful life, I would much rather listen to someone who's 120 and functional than someone who's 20 and can do a few tricks on Instagram. So I think this is important. You know, the older someone gets, provided they're still functioning, they must have something to share. So I learned a lot of these Chinese teachers and also these very elderly teachers in India. And I'm still learning off these people now, including the um, Hungarian teacher, Sundanath, who's also on this summit. You'll hear him speak, perhaps, or I, I suggest everyone listen to him. He's quite remarkable. And he's 12 years my senior. And he taught me for uh, pretty much from 25 to about 40, I was with him fairly all the time, you know. So with all of that, then I've come to a place now where it's almost difficult to call what I call yoga because it's not just Indian. I've got an understanding, I think, which has merged from India, China, Tibet, Japan, South Africa, um, Australia, South America, North America, and also Western medical science. So what I've tried to piece together is the common truths in all of these systems, because they're the bits that make sense for everyone. And then what I tried to do was to bring this together for the modern body, because we haven't got the same type of physical body that you know, someone who say who lives squatting to go to the toilet, cross-legged for every meal, walking as a mode of locomotion. What we do instead is we sit to go to the toilet, to eat, to, to locomote, you know, so and it's destroyed our physical body in terms of hips being too tight, spine becoming very stiff, neck being problematic. And then on top of that, the physiology of the modern body has been disturbed because of so much problems physically and because of the media, many people will over tighten their pelvic floor, draw their navel to the spine, think that they're going to look better by lifting their chest and pulling their shoulders back and down, which you often hear in modern exercise classes. Even physiotherapy Pilates classes will often give you these things, which basically not just lock the physical body into a loss of freedom and more joint problems, but they also upset the physiology of the body and people become physiologically unwell. They're immune to Digestive reproductive systems are not working. I got very interested in physiology as I delved more into this because muscles and joints are fairly easy to fix. But to fix your immune system, digestive reproductive system, using something other than drugs and surgery, 
that was more interesting and more challenging. And as I'm approaching now, you know, my seventh decade, I'm in my seventh decade, I'm much more interested in the mind and emotions and stuff like this. It's all coming together. I'm interested in how to get the best results for most people, most of the time, in terms of the modern body, how we can use traditional posture, movement, breathing, mindfulness to help people physically, physiologically, mentally, in the present moment, immediately after their practice in the short term future, and to have a good chance that in 20 or 30 years time, they're still going to be functional. Simon, that was so rich. Thank you for sharing. And one of the things that came up for me was this confluence as you were talking about the autonomic or automatic nervous system, and then a reference to the emotions. So I hope that you'll dig into that a little bit more. And related to that, I think, but maybe you can set me straight, was this idea of deep swimming. You didn't say it, but when I think of deep swimming, I think of holding the breath. So I'm thinking already there's something about breath and also the longevity of a cycle of breath that may be related to this physiological state that you're talking about. about and, and here's a third question, and you can play with these. Um, meditation, concentration, relaxation. Those were three words I heard related, and I'm not sure if you see them as different or as basically a continuum. So I'll stop there, but those were the things you generated in me. I'm an exercise physiologist and also did a book on dynamic embodiment of the sun salutation from a neuroendocrine point of view. So I'm just completely fascinated by everything you're saying. Oh, wow. I, I want to read your book. That sounds amazing. <laughs> uh, I, I think that we get benefits from doing things like exercise. We get benefits from doing things like relaxation and what people will call meditation and passive things and resting and sleeping. But often when we do one or the other, there are some negative implications. So for example, when most people exercise, it induces stress. Now, many people write about this and they make it seem like too much exercise causes stress. But we live in a world of normal. And I think normal is very different to natural. And so what most people see as normal may already be dysfunctional. Hence, we see a lot of problems in terms of immune dysfunctions, reproductive system dysfunctions, digestive dysfunctions, and people just accept it as normal. My understanding now, after the training that I've got, my personal experience observing thousands of clients, and also comparing the physiology of the East and the West and you know the, the traditional systems I've worked with, is that if you are feeling anything of the following, you're probably going to put yourself in a state which we can call sympathetic nervous system dominance, as opposed to parasympathetic nervous system dominance, where the sympathetic nervous system in lay terms is obviously the state of flight or flight, flight, fight, fear, if you like. And the state of parasympathetic dominance is that nervous system state we could call the state of rest, relaxation, rejuvenation, regeneration. Okay, so I like to use those, those lay terms as well. So when you are exercising, I think the body enters a stressful state, the sympathetic dominant state, much more than people realize. If your heart rate increases, the body thinks you're running away from something. You'll start to have this perception you're on a cellular level, on a subconscious cellular level, that you're running away from a perceived saber-toothed tiger. Of course, you think you're in an exercise class, but your cells think you're running away from something. So they go, put all the energy into running away. Turn off non-essential functions such as immune system, digestive system, reproductive system. Then if you are having uh, breathing more than normal, if your minute ventilation is more than normal, then your body thinks you're also running away from something. The body does not think you're running away from something if your heart rate is low and your breath is low. So often what we get told in the West, especially in the media, is you should get your heart rate up. You should breathe more. But logically, fit people run fast, hardly breathe at all, and the heart rate stays low. So it actually makes more sense to do more things with less heart racing and less breath. That's actually an expression of fitness. 
But most people actually will emphasize, get the heart rate up, which I believe is promoting a stress response, which is depleting people's immune digestive reproductive functions. And the breathing that people do often, even the very mention of the word breath, will usually make people hyperventilate. Now, hyperventilation technically means obviously uh, breathing more than you really need to breathe for that particular activity you're doing. On you know, any medical textbook will say the symptoms of breathing more than normal will be less blood to the brain, less oxygen to your cells, less energy produced by the energy making mechanisms of the body, a more hypersensitive nervous system, less transfer of oxygen from the lungs into the blood. You breathe more than normal, you get less energy, you get less blood flow, you become more nervous, you become more stressed. So often people having a panic attack, you, you, everyone's heard the story of put someone in a paper bag and make them rebreathe their own air because that builds up carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is our friend. And in the world of modern yoga, everyone thinks prana is oxygen, whereas actually the older texts that I read were talking about carbon dioxide as being as much the prana as the oxygen. You know, in the air we breathe, we have about 20% oxygen, about 0.5% carbon dioxide. But to make cellular respiration take place inside our bodies, as you know very well, you need about 6 or 7% oxygen, 6 or 7% carbon dioxide. So really the job of breathing is to reduce oxygen by, you know, to 30% of its current levels and to increase carbon dioxide by up to 14 times. And the best way of doing that for most normal people is just to forget about breathing, just focus on being relaxed. And the more you forget about breathing and focus on being relaxed, the more naturally you breathe. And the wonderful thing about breathing, because everyone talks about breathing as being the link between conscious and unconscious, it's not the breathing, it's the diaphragm. The diaphragm is a muscle which is controlled by part of our nervous system, which can also be controlled by conscious mind and unconscious mind. So we're able to say, I'm able to use my diaphragm by breathing into my belly, if you like to think of it that way. And I could do that consciously. Most of us could do that. You could put your hand on your lower belly, inhale, feel a sense of ex expansion there. That's breathing with your diaphragm. But in your deepest, most regenerative cycle while you're asleep, it's happening by itself. And so breathing is this thing, not the breathing. The diaphragm is a muscle which has dual control. It is the bridge between conscious and unconscious. But the remarkable thing about that is that it's not the only one. There are at least 11 other places which also have dual control. Places like our eyes, which can blink, which we can blink consciously, but if someone puts something in front of your face, you blink automatically. Similarly, your eye muscles. You know that you can look up and down, but if you open the eyes of someone who's asleep, their eyes are looking up. It happens consciously and unconsciously. Similarly, your swallowing apparatus, your ability to make saliva, your jaw, your lips, your pelvic floor, front, back, and middle. And surprisingly, your fingers, their connection to shoulders, your neck, your pelvis, connection to toes. These are 12 bridges between the conscious and the unconscious. And if you just say to people, forget about your breathing, just focus on relax. Relax these other 11 places. They become pronouncedly relaxed. And they forget to breathe, but of course they're breathing just enough to survive. And that breathing just enough to survive means there's no over-breathing, because over-breathing actually retards blood flow. And so as soon as they relax, they breathe less, blood starts to flow better. And what tends to block energy and information through the body is also muscle tension. So when you relieve the tension, which many people carry in their pelvic floor, in their abdomen, in their shoulders, in their neck, in their jaw, in their face, in their eyes, already you're unblocking the blockages of good energy and loving information inside the body. You see, I believe, as I said at the start, that if the world were to really express the idea of what yoga could want or qigong could want and what every traditional culture says we have, that we are all connected as one. Better act like we're all connected as one. And if you're going to act like you're connected with someone, the best way to connect is by sharing your good energy and your loving information with that person the same way our mothers did to us. But 
you have to have a model. And the model for sharing good energy and loving information, the only one we can really know is the one that can happen inside ourselves. So if you can make every cell of your body share good energy and loving information with every other cell, that's 50 trillion cells all working as one. That is yoga. That is connection. And the way we do that, I'll call sharing good energy, enhancing blood flow while keeping heart rate low. I'll call sharing loving information inside your body to be that dominance of your parasympathetic nervous system, the place we call rest, relaxation, rejuvenation, regeneration, where the body is not experiencing fear or flight or fight, where the body feels safe. It feels love, peace, trust, safety. But of course, in a state of sympathetic dominance, you feel fear, anger, aggression, lack of safety, lack of trust. So, of course, then you're going to turn off immune, reproductive, digestive functions. But if you're feeling peace, love, safety, trust, which is what the parasympathetic nervous system offers, then you go, and not only do I have these feelings inside themselves, I'm embodying them. And blood is circulating, so you have energy. If you have energy and you feel relaxed, it's a pretty good recipe for being mentally happy. You know, it's easy to be energized and stressed. It's easy to be relaxed and have no energy. But when you have that wonderful moment, that sweet spot of having energy plus relaxation, safety, a sense of love and peace and safety, it's a recipe for being able to easily have happiness as your default natural function. So the two most important things I think we need to focus on are to share good energy and loving information inside our body. And if I had to break it into three potential aims for our personal practice of posture, movement, breathing, mental control, call it whatever you want. You can call it your daily walk, your swim, your qigong, your martial arts, your dance, your yoga, whatever you like. Then while you're doing these things, make three things. Number one aim is you're not doing it for some future goal of getting strong and flexible. You're doing it to connect with yourself in the here and now. It's not about the destination. It's about the journey. So make your aim to share good energy and loving information inside your body in a way where your body's not going to feel threatened, where you're not going to risk injuring yourself. Do something which is sustainable, engaging, calming, effortless, but invigorating at the same time. And then having that as your aim, then you have to go, well, what stops good energy and loving information inside the body? Well, there are five things. Too much tension, too much stretching or poor posture or overstretching in exercise classes or just the worst type of stretching that most modern people do is sitting on a chair where the back of the body is overstretched, the front is squashed. It's terrible, you know. Overtension, overstretching, they block energy and good energy and loving information. Then overbreathing. Then overthinking, one of the biggest culprits. And then the other one, overeating. So what my motto is to my students is tense less, stretch less, breathe less, think less, eat less. Subject to still being able to do what you want to do. And the thing is, if you work properly in this system, you find that it's easy to live a life then where you just don't feel that hungry. I mean, of course, I mean, with children, you tell them, Eat more. You're gonna, you've got to get big and strong for children. But once you've grown up, how much bigger do you want to get? Let's face it. Most people die of overeating. So if you can just take that as the second step, first step, make your aim to move good energy and loving information through a safe, stable body. This vehicle will be traveling. Second thing, stop blocking good energy and loving information inside your body. Tense less, stretch less, breathe less, think less, eat less. Third thing is make the good energy and loving information circulate more easily. And for that, there's a few really simple tricks, which actually you can observe children do, animals do. It's about natural movement. It's about moving actively rather than being a victim of external forces such as gravity, one limb pulling another or momentum. It's about moving from your core, not locking your core, working from your gut brain, your enteric nervous system not just having a tight abs, you know, tight abdominal region to look good, sucking your belly to the spine the whole time. And then moving from your core and breathing from your core or breathing more naturally or more deeply, it's being connected to these bridges between conscious and the unconscious and having that connection always. So you know that these things in your body, these places like the eyes, the lips, the jaw, the mouth, the pelvic floor, the diaphragm, get connected to those places. 
And then when you do, you have access to your unconscious. And so then the last thing is you learn to flow. Energy moves in a fluid way, not back and forth, not up and down. It flows in circles. Because if you move left, right, or up or down, you get like brake and accelerator turning on and it's jarring for the body. So if you drive in a car back and forth, left, right, or you know, forward and backward, it's going to cause jarring and waste energy by braking and accelerating. But if you drive in a circle, you get centripetal, centrifugal energy, and energy builds. Joints naturally want to move in curved patterns, but exercise often makes us move linearly. You know, it's um, so exercise is good, but it causes stress. Relaxation is great but it doesn't generally build muscle strength, encourage bone density, tissue density. It doesn't move blood. So what we need really for ongoing health, happiness, and longevity is the combination between exercise and relaxation. In yoga, they call it stira sukham asanam in India. Stira means firm, sukham means calm. Together, they could mean get a balance between your sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system, like the treble and the bass of a stereo not one off one on but a balance and for me like if i'm exercising i think okay it's not that i always i'm going to be totally relaxed and never get my heart rate up maybe one to ten percent of the time i'll get my heart rate up but not 45 minutes three times a week five times a week like they tell us <laughs> so that relates so much to this concept that I think you're introducing to the world. Perhaps uh, you got it from someone else and you can share that. But this idea of, you know, the workout is so much this kind of sympathetic getting into fight flight. I've got to do it. No pain, no gain is the extreme. More people are learning to stay relaxed with it. And what I hear you say that I love is this term of kind of relaxed alertness how to, or invigoration while relaxed and calm. Uh, can you talk more about work in versus work out? <laughs> yes, I, I love this expression. I, I've um, It's been one of my favorite expressions that you don't benefit that much from a workout because a workout often is where you have less energy at the end of your practice, more need for food and sleep, and often you're sore either immediately afterwards or the next day. Whereas what I'd rather do is a work in and a work in for me is something where at the end of the practice, I have more energy at the end of my practice, less need for food, less need for sleep and a completely pain free body. Many of my students will actually say, I really enjoyed the practice yesterday, but I'm not sore today. Does that mean I'm not going to get stronger? And I'm going, you don't actually have to suffer to improve. The mentality of no pain, no gain is prevalent in the world today, as is the idea of survival of the fittest. You know, before I became a physiotherapist, I was a molecular biologist, you know, and survival of the fittest is a very outdated idea. It's, it's part of this Darwinian concept that perhaps was um, motivated to be propagated by the idea that many of the colonial countries like France and UK and Portugal and Spain were dominating other countries and saying, well, we're the stronger country, therefore it's acceptable via nature. This was a justification for usurping whole traditional cultures. Was now we know that nature works best by cooperation. Nature works by cooperation, not by survival of the fittest. It's symbiosis. And so this is a much better motto, I think. A lot of my teaching to my students, the first week is them going, oh, this is the opposite of what I've been told, but I, I can see your point. It seems to work. And I make them feel why it works. But for the first week, they're going, but it's the complete opposite. And I've realized I need at least a few hours, if not at least a week with my clients to unlearn, to get them to unlearn the things that our society have imprinted on them. Things like, if you're good, you're going to go to heaven. If you're bad, you're going to go to hell. Survival of the fit, fit, you know, fittest. There's no free lunch, no pain, no gain. These things are actually making people just, they're, they're making the wrong things happen, you know? So, well, thank you for that. Uh, I hope that we've, you know, had enough um, speaking, let's say, um, I love thinking, and I also am really digesting what you've said about how much thinking is enough, and at what point perhaps being with or doing might be better. So I'm leading into 
might there be a practice that you'd like to share with us that also really explicates this process of encouraging blood circulation without necessarily increasing the heart rate? And or how does this relate to our daily lives? So if you want to speak a little bit more and then take us into a practice, I would find that really juicy. That's wonderful. Uh, I think that, let me just quickly restate what I said before. If you have this as your aim to make good energy and loving information circulate through your body, where the good energy is enhanced blood flow, the loving information is going to be this dominance of the parasympathetic nervous system, then I think that's the best recipe for um, ongoing physiological health. And as I mentioned before, with that sensation that comes with having more energy and also being relaxed, then it's a good place to be on a mental level. But the physical level, sometimes people wonder about. If I just work in a very gentle way, am I still going to get strong and flexible? So often when I meet students for the first time, especially if they're fitness junkies or yoga practitioners who are very much obsessed with, I want to get stronger, I want to get a better result, then I often have to show them different ways where you can actually get flexible without stretching. You can actually get stronger without having to feel tense. You can actually improve without needing to have pain as a side effect. And so this for many people is very, very difficult to comprehend until I actually give them an example. So what I often do to do this is I use active postures. So for example, in a typical yoga class, you might get shown a particular position where maybe one side of the body is lengthened, one side shortened. And often it's a posture where you slump into it, where the ground supports you and gravity basically takes you into a posture. If you do exactly the same shape, but you lift your body into that position rather than dropping your body into that position with the external forces of gravity or one limb pulling another or momentum, then what happens is the muscles that take you into a posture become shortened and active. Then the opposing muscles become lengthened and reciprocally relaxed by a nerve reflex, as you know very well. And what this does as well is it releases the stretch reflex. You see, a lot of times when people are doing passive stretches, then what they're feeling is not a lengthened muscle. They're feeling a lengthened muscle that has become tense via a stretch reflex. And so that mostly is what people are experiencing as stretch. So if you can simply get rid of the stretch reflex, range of movement increases significantly for most people. And the easiest way to release the stretch reflex, which, you know, for people who are unaware of the term is when the, the doctor hits your knee with a hammer and, and the knee jerks up like that. Any muscle which is unexpectedly lengthened by an external force, like a hammer, or like our bodies falling into a hamstring stretch, they're falling by gravity. The hamstrings are being hit by the gravitational hammer. So that muscle is then going to feel stretch, not because it's just lengthened, but because it's lengthened and tense. So to get rid of the stretch reflex, by using activation of the opposing muscle group, and the simplest way of doing that is by just making your body move into a pose, not forcing it to a pose. Then what happens is the stretch reflex goes away and you suddenly get more flexible, but you're also encouraging strength on one side of the joint with relaxation on the opposite side of the joint, which builds strength while not focusing on tensing your muscles. And at the same time, the compressed and uh, active side of the joint pushes blood away, while the lengthened, relaxed side of the joint will pull blood towards that region. So whereas normally we think of the heart pumping the blood, where the heart is this four-chambered apparatus where one chamber squeezes, the next chamber expands, second chamber squeezes, third chamber expands with the lungs in the middle. But this is what you can do with your whole body. If you activate and compress one region and then relax and expand another region, blood will move from the compressed region 
to the expanded region. The same way when you squeeze a sponge, water goes out, expand a sponge, water comes in. So I've done research, for example, and I'll stand up for this, where I can move my body into a compressed position like this. The left side of my body is now firm and compressed. The right side is lengthened and relaxed. At that moment, my left trunk will come to 32 degrees. My right trunk will go to 37 degrees. And within the space of three seconds, I can move from one side to the next. And the reason why my trunk changes temperature from 32 degrees to 37 is because less blood goes there. So as soon as you compress one region, less blood's going to be there. Expand another region, more blood goes there. But it has to be expanded and relaxed compressed and tense. And this is a really key way of making people work. So when I first instruct people, this is one of the first things I'll teach, move actively. And when you move actively, you get better strength without tension, better flexibility without stretching, better blood flow without the heart racing. And actually these movements, you can just show people and they'll copy you. Whereas most postures people practice for flexibility will only work if you apply resistance. You have to actually press one bit against the other, what people might call proprioceptive neuromuscular facilitation in, in various different types of exercise modalities, which are too hard to even say for most people, let alone even understand what they mean or how to do them. You know, like if you have to say to someone in a yogic standing pose, turn your right foot out, but try and turn the right thigh in. I want you to move your right hand to the right side, but try and push it to the left side. And they actually move it. You go, no, keep it on the right, try and move it to the left. It's so confusing. So I found that most modern yoga won't work because to make it work, you have to have such a head trip to make the instructions actually valuable. And, you know, often the same is true with many uh, modalities in, in the fitness regime and the exercise regime as well. The other important thing is move from your core. Don't lock your core. So the core is the enteric nervous system, essentially. And around it is this immune, digestive, reproductive organs. There's also a whole bunch of muscles. But the muscles that most people focus on are not the most important muscles. The most important core muscles perhaps would be things like the diaphragm and your psoas muscle. The psoas muscle is a major hip flexor to the front of the hip for most people if they don't know. And what it does is it connects to your diaphragm. So if you simply were to go from sit to stand, as soon as you stand up, the diaphragm gets pulled down. As soon as you sit down, the diaphragm is going to move back up. So what I'll often get people doing is I'll get them to stand and just from standing, just bend and straighten their knees a little bit. And if you get someone to stand and then bend their knees a little bit, then straighten the knees a little bit and you make them just focus on totally be relaxed. And as they're doing that, the hips going up and down will be stimulating the diaphragm to move up and down. So if I say just someone stand with your knees slightly bent, then bend your knees a little bit more for six seconds. Now straighten the knees a little bit more for six seconds. As they're doing that, breathing is happening as you go up. Breathing out happens when you go down. But you don't tell them that because as soon as they think they're meant to be breathing, they over breathe. But if you monitor them, not only is a little breath in, a little breath out happening in synchrony with someone moving their hips up and down, but their heart rate variability will change as well. So you can see that as they go up, heart rate goes to maybe 75 beats per minute. When they go down, heart rate can drop down to 45. Up to 75, down to 45. There's your intermittent high intensity interval training. So we don't need to have a healthy heart rate of just 60 beats per minute for most of the week and then take it up to 150 for three times a week, five times a week. And we don't need to do high intensity interval training where we're doing you know, five minutes of walking, 30 seconds of running. Maybe just do gentle exercise, which can be like the most simple version of a salute to the sun, which would be if I were to do it, stand, I could go inhale arms up, exhale arms down. Salute to the sun is a further extension of that, isn't it? I don't have to put my hands on the floor and I just do that. Then people say, doesn't look like salute to the sun, doesn't look like yoga, looks more like qigong. Well, qigong and yoga are the same thing. You know, some of my teachers, I had teachers from Tibet, China and India, great teachers. 
They were all born within 600 kilometers of each other. One called themselves Chinese, one calls themselves Tibetan, one Indian, it's the same exercises. Just tense less, stretch less, breathe less, think less. And what happens then is these very simple movements start to restore natural function. There's many tricks I could use, but maybe just to give an idea, a taste of this for people in the small room that I've got here, I'll ask people either to sit on a chair or stand. And so I, I'm semi-standing now with my knees bent so you can see me. And I'll ask everyone to lengthen their fingers like this. Now, it's easier for most people if you sit it's easier for most people if you let your hands rest by the side like this. So I'm going to lift my hands up and certainly you can and I'm bending my knees quite a lot. But much easier is your knees just a tiny bit bent or sit on a chair and your hands low. Now, from this position, I'm going to give you six little exercises which will connect you with the bridges between conscious and unconscious. Plus, they help you reset the nervous system and they'll also move blood. So we'll focus on these six places. I want you to think first, number one is your fingertips. Lengthen your fingertips and I make the fingers move. And when I say make them move, not just wiggle, wiggle, lengthen them and then move them like the fronds of a sea anemone. So lengthen your fingers. It's like playing a piano. You can go little finger first or thumb first. And so lengthen your fingers, make them as lengthened as they can be, but as soft as they can be. So lengthen your fingers, check the fingers can move. Make them softer, make them gentle, but see if you can sense the tips of the fingers. And now we can put the fingers on remote control. You can either stop them like me, or you can keep moving them. And then the second place is your shoulders. Keep your shoulders moving away from each other, then just gently roll the shoulders. Now I'm not asking you to stretch, that's a big stretch. So make it maybe, 30% of your maximum movement, just make them roll in a circle. So I'll turn sideways so you see, I'm rolling my shoulders. And I'm making my shoulders roll much more than they need to, just so you can see, but it's also enough to do that. So fingers can move, shoulders can roll. Now, third place is your neck. Make the neck lengthened and then move your neck either in a circle, chin in, up, forward, down, in, up, forward, down. Not so big that it becomes a stretch. It should be much less than a stretch. Tiny, so relax your neck and move your chin. Now you could also try moving your chin in a little infinity sign like this. Not to stretch your neck, just a tiny one. Little chin movements, a little figure eight or infinity sign. Make it so gentle, so little. And then, the next place is your pelvic floor. Many people say, tighten your pelvic floor. And I'll say, well, if something's going to fall out when you stand up, then yes, maybe tighten your pelvic floor. But if nothing falls out when you stand up, maybe your pelvic floor doesn't need tightening. If people tighten their pelvic floor too much, well, there's names for people like that, isn't it? So maybe it's overdone for most people. Relax. If you've got a problem, of course, keep it tight. But if you can relax your pelvic floor, now move your pelvis. So like I was saying before, if you can, go down and up with your pelvis. And best is to make a circle. So try, go down on your toes, come up on your heels. Go down on your toes, come up on your heels. Make a little circle with your pelvis. And as you're doing it, think, relax your pelvic floor. Let it go as soft as you comfortably can, like when you're asleep. And then the fifth place is your abdomen. So keep as you are, but I'll just show you my belly like this. I can make my abdomen roll like a belly dancer. You don't need to do that. If you can learn it one day, it's fantastic. But what I'll suggest is just check. Can you breathe into your abdomen? So when you inhale, the breath is not in your chest. It's inhale to the abdomen and exhale softly. Just every once in a while, check that. Then the sixth place, the fun one is your face. Relax your face. So to relax your face, make saliva, swallow it. Then make your jaw gently move, like chewing soft, yummy food. Not grinding, just mm. Your jaw can move forward, back, side to side, up, down. So make it move in nice patterns. Mm. Then the next place is your lips. 
free up your lips. So you make your lips smile, kiss, smile, kiss. Practice on buses and trains. People love you for this. Mm. 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 And then your eyes, like a slow motion blink, open eye, half close, open eye, half close. Like when you're waking from a deep rejuvenative sleep, like when you're about to fall asleep. Now make the inner eyes look up, down, left, right. Eyes can move in a little clockwise circle. Maybe go round your clock, go to 12 o'clock, drop to six, go anti-clockwise like a yin-yang symbol. Go eyes going in a circle, go to 12 o'clock, drop to six, go opposite direction. And now all at once, gently, you focus on one bit at a time, but set the rest on automatic. Fingers lengthen, fingers can move. Shoulders apart, shoulders can roll. Neck lengthen, neck is free. Pelvic floor relax, pelvis can roll. Back lengthened, abdomen can breathe or roll and the face relaxed. One more time. I'll point, you try and make length and relaxation. Fingers can move, shoulders can roll, neck is free, pelvic floor relaxed. Tummy can breathe with your back lengthened and face relaxed. Be here, be now, be still, calm and quiet in body, breath and mind. Just close your eyes for a few moments and just be lengthened and relaxed, easier with your hands by the side, easier with your legs more straight. And then just notice if your body feels a little bit warmer, a little bit more energized, a little bit more inner peace, a little bit more connected. Open your eyes. How do you feel? Hugely warm and kind of, um, well, sinuous is the word that came up for me, but um, fluid, there's the other. I really feel that we're moving blood, synovial fluid, uh, probably the lymph not stopping, but continuing. It, it felt great. Thank you so much for the feedback. It's um, I've used that for people who are about to commit suicide, mm. people who are fully having epileptic fits, people who are fully in panic attacks. Mm. And also for people with Raynaud's disease, you know, people who have a problem with blood circulation. And all manner of things are usually helped if you can just get people to connect with these, well, I call them 12 bridges between the conscious and the unconscious. And I put them into six simple groups like that. And it can really make a big difference. But connecting with them, it's enough just to think about them. But if you actually move them as well, then these very gentle movements actually start to pump blood and help you reset the nervous system and connect your thinking brain with your action brain, the core. And then from there, you get a much better result as well, because the body is such a connected thing. But by linking to these particular places and also really linking to the central place in your enteric nervous system and freeing up your lower back, by bending the knee slightly and dropping the sitting bones so your lower back uncurves. Mm. That's really important because many people, nine out of 10 people have lower back pain and it's usually lower back pain waiting to happen. You know, so sometimes they don't experience it. But if you get someone to simply respond to the instructions, stand up straight, lift up your tailbone, pull the shoulders back and down, their back will hurt. Only one in 10 will not feel uncomfortable so most people have got back problems because that shouldn't hurt but it does on most adults and that partly is reflected by a massive energy drain because the lower back where it's compressed mostly is the back entrance to the true core or the you know the seat of your enteric nervous system so by releasing your lower back by having the knees slightly bent and taking the tension off the psoas muscle which pulls your lower back inwards then the lower back pain goes, energy starts to happen, and then you can start to breathe more naturally. The diaphragm isn't as locked as when people are, when they're fully standing up straight, when the, the front of the hips are so taut from sitting on chairs all day long. 
there's a lot in there, but so much. I mean, I really felt that just keeping the knees bent and letting the pelvic floor just kind of be this ball that it is um, was primary to almost everything else that we did in a certain way. It's so lovely to work with you because you really have got this wonderful physiological background. I, um, <laughs> you know, my my science head wants to fully go into technical science aspects of it, but I I always try and we should, you know, we have to try and keep it uh, for a general audience. But I think to experience this is the best. So if people want. I'll be leaving a, a package of simple practices which people can download from the shift site later on. And at any time, people can contact me. I'm happy to be written to by anyone who listens to this talk. And you can either go to um, my full name on Facebook if you want to you know, get stuck. But also, you can write to me. I'm Simon at simonborgolivia.com. So if you look up my name, that my website comes up and just put Simon in front of my full name as one word. And uh, I have I have so much things of, available online, but I also travel the world and I'd love to meet people in person. I, I like sharing things online, but if I can meet people in person, I can do so much more. Because in the end, it's about connection. You know, we can connect a lot online. It's wonderful. But real life is pretty special. I um, so agree. And Simon, I encourage everybody to have the chance to meet you. And I look forward to that in-person meeting at some point as well. Uh, thank you for this luscious hour together. Uh, I, I know that I have a lot to gently chew on, and I'm looking forward to digesting it unconsciously and consciously. I really appreciated all your questions and the way you asked me. I perhaps got a little bit flighty and talked a little bit in different ways. So I've only been able to give a hint of what I'm saying. But if people would like to see all my information, it comes together very, very nicely. There's a real logical feeling and flow to it. So I would love to share more with you know anyone who's listening. So thank you very, very much to the Shift Network for inviting us. Thank you, Martha, for, for talking to me. It's such a pleasure to spend some time with you. I was really looking forward to this because what you do is absolutely phenomenal. And uh, I hope we get to do more later. Thank you. And thank you, everyone, for having me. Bless you. All the best.